<clears throat> looks like everybody's looks like everybody's had a chance to get their coffee, and uh, it's my pleasure today to uh, introduce uh, our speaker, Dr. Murray Brennan. Um, as you may have read from the brochure, he's a native New Zealander who had his undergraduate and medical education there, and then uh, came to the states to uh, work at the Brigham with Freddie Moore and George Cahill on uh, primarily metabolism at the time and uh, surgical metabolism, and then uh, finished his training at the uh, at the Brigham under Freddie Moore, and then went to uh, the National Cancer Institute where he spent a number of years and where he became interested in the subject that he's presenting today and uh, then had an opportunity to go to New York where he headed the uh, mixed tumor and gastric service at the Memorial Hospital for a number of years before becoming chief of surgery at the uh, <coughs> at Memorial Hospital. So he's had a very distinguished career and we're so pleased to have him here. Some years ago I was interested in sarcomas and in fact wrote a chapter in a book uh, about uh, sarcomas. Uh, unfortunately, at the time, the uh, the names of the sarcomas have changed in the uh, in the interim since I published that chapter, and I uh, hardly recognize some of the tumors. Uh, there were lumpers and splitters at that time. Uh, lumpers were primarily surgeons who didn't have a large series who had to publish whatever they had, so they lumped all the sarcomas together and tried to make some sense out of the results. But as time has gone by and people like Dr. Brennan have explored sarcomas more actively and have larger numbers, we uh, we end up learning more about the individual sarcomas. Uh, and I'm sure we're going to be greatly enlightened by his uh, presentation today. Thank you, Dr. Brennan. Thank you, Dr. Rust, and thank you for the uh, kind invitation to be here. The young lady who presented before was the perfect entrance to some of the things I'm going to tell you about. Um, if you have the lights down a little bit, so far uh, this is all I've seen of San Antonio. It was dark when I came and some, it was dark when someone picked me up this morning, so it was the bottom left-hand corner. The uh, subject's been an interest of mine, as, as Dr. Aus says, for 30 years since we began looking at it in 1975 at the National Cancer Institute. I'd like to take the time to use sarcoma, not just to tell you some of the things I've learned about it, but to use it as an example of how you can actually study a problem if you're committed enough to it early on. We began uh, in 1982 uh, a prospective database of all the patients that were admitted to uh, the surgical service at Memorial with soft tissue sarcoma. And as you can see now, we've got well over 7,000 patients in that database, probably the largest sarcoma database in the world. It's all collected prospectively. I still meet <clears throat> every single Wednesday for an hour with the data managers, the pathologist, medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, to ensure that these data are correct. So we see about 600 new sarcomas each year. Um, and these are just the ones that get admitted and get treated uh, with, uh, uh, with some form of in-house care. So this isn't the consultations. Um, let's see. I'm sorry. Whenever I do something like that with a computer, I usually say, excuse me, I'm your surgeon. <clears throat> As you well know, the, uh, about half of all sarcomas occur in the extremities, most of them in the proximal thigh. We know <clears throat> very clearly a lot about the etiology. There is a clear genetic predisposition in diseases, particularly neurofibromatosis, uh, which uh, first uh, described over 100 years ago. And it's a real challenge in the people with the NF1 to know when is a neurofibroma, which can be quite large, actually a malignant tumor. In Dr. Aust's chapter, it would have been neurofibrosarcoma. We now call it a malignant peripheral nerve sheath tumor. And it's hard sometimes to determine that uh, in that disease. We know a lot about the leaf ramini syndrome, which of course is based on a P53 mutation, a tumor suppressor gene, that in patients who have that mutation, the risk of getting a soft tissue or bony sarcoma under the age of 45 is about 30 times uh, the uh, about 30 times what it is in the general population, and that the risk of getting uh, adenocarcinoma, usually intra-abdominal, is 100 times what you'd expect. Of course, these syndromes uh, exist as a patient in this hospital at this time who will have a leaf for almost for sure. It's just a matter of us recognizing it. 
you heard a little bit about radiation exposure and, and uh, angiosarcoma, and that's rather fortuitous because we've had a real interest in uh, the radiation-induced uh, sarcomas. And, of course, the typical pattern is a boy like this who's had mantle irradiation for his, uh, excuse me, for his Hodgkin's disease, and he develops in the midline a sarcoma. It can be either soft tissue or bony. The usually uh, histopathology is what we call malignant fibrous histiocytoma. That's a foolish name. It's nothing to do with histiocytes at all. It's almost certainly uh, fibrous sarcoma variants, and we learn more about that all the time. This was the question that uh, I that the uh, pathologist alluded to, if you have a diagnosis, then you're 50 times more likely to have been previously irradiated for your breast cancer. And I'm going to take a moment or two to, to divert a little bit on that because of the concern about the very uh, liberal use of radiation uh, therapy in this country for breast cancer. If you look at the second uh, malignancies in patients who've undergone uh, cervical cancer, you can see that, in fact, the uh, patients who undergo radiation, their prevalence twice as many times, four times as many times, five times as many times likely if they've received radiation to develop a subsequent second sarcoma. And if you think about it, these are not inconsequential numbers. Here, here you're talking about 178 patients who could they have been treated without radiation. I won't debate the merits, so obviously, of the therapy be avoided. And so it's a challenge for the generation sitting in green, perhaps, that to look at what we have done in our generation and perhaps think a little more thoughtfully about how we might approach this differently. This is a typical example of the cumulative risk of patients undergoing radiation for breast cancer. This is a, a, a Japanese study, but you can see here 35 uh, or 27 radiation-associated tumors and only one in the patients who didn't undergo radiation. And when you think about it, lumpectomy and radiation is standard treatment in this country in the majority of situations. It doesn't mean that's wrong, but this is an essential lethal disease. And so we might reconsider whether an 8-millimeter lesion needs to be uh, full-course radiation therapy. I see at least every month a radiation-induced sarcoma in the breast. I've seen them in patients who have had uh, widespread radiation for DCIS, a, a questionable uh, entity as to how aggressive we should be about that. It doesn't mean it's wrong. It just says that we might like to think a little more seriously. Now, it is true. I have a highly selected practice, and so on my angst is that I see way too many of these. <clears throat> the majority of surgeons who take care of breast cancer will see one or two in a lifetime, as you heard before. But it's a real problem because in most patients, that's a lethal disease. I saw one just yesterday, uh, Friday, when I see patients, a woman who, who's only 35, who's had bilateral lumpectomies for a 6-millimeter and an 8-millimeter lesion and now has a radiation-induced sarcoma, which will require, at a minimum, a four, four rib uh, chest wall resection and with a high probability that she'll develop uh, bony metastasis within the next 5 to 10 years. So I apologize if I feel uh, seem too highlighted by that, but it's a real, real event. And this just says the, the same kind of issue when you look at standardized incident ratios in people who s survive childhood in terms of what they're likely to do again. Now, again, you have to put that into perspective. Um, when I began my surgical residency, essentially all childhood sarcomas were, in, all childhood tumors were incurable. And of course, 80% are not now. So it comes with a price of cure, but the second malignance is very real. This just illustrates exactly the same point, just to make it so graphic that the uh, secondary sarcoma after childhood, and the important thing to see that this curve does not stop this is 35 years, and you can see at 20 years, it continues to accumulate the risk. So I, my message is, as we all think about what we do, whether it's in surgery or radiation, think about the consequences. And the only way you can do that is by having databases such as what I've described. Most people talk about uh, the management malignancy, five years equals cure. And of course, we know constantly that's not so. Not so for the primary tumor, not so for the secondary tumor. I'm interested in pancreas cancer. It's one of the things we do. And if you look at actual survivors of pancreatic adenocarcinoma, we know there are late recurrences from pancreatic cancer beyond five years. And so that's true for essentially all diseases. Um, uh, that's beating, the, beating the, the, the horse. Just saying over and over again, you add chemotherapy to that, and then your standardized incidence ratios go markedly. 
So I've ho I hope that's the first part of one of the things I want to point out is what are the consequences of our management, the importance of these long-term databases, the importance. I tell my fellows, you'll start a database when you go to a new place. No one will want to help you. It will be nothing but hard work for three or four years. There's nothing there for three or four years. But come five years, then you begin to be able to tell something, and I'll show you other things you can learn from databases contrary to what uh, you might not have thought about. Uh, lymphedema is an etiological agent, whether it's surgically created, congenital, or parasitic. And of course, this gentleman uh, was a breast surgeon at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and he, along with a pathologist, Fred Stewart, gentleman standing here, this is Sophie Spitz, as in Spitz Nevis, and they re described an entity of post-mastectomy lymphedema uh, with associated lymphangiosarcoma. And they described that in 1948. So about 60 years ago, and it's important that we recognize that because it, again, begins this idea of just looking at what has taken place in the past. And, of course, it looks like this. This is a woman, who, it's an old picture, who's had a radical mastectomy, something we wouldn't do now. She's developed, they've been irradiated. She's developed lymphedema. It's not radiation-induced solely, of course, because there's a lesion, there's an angiosarcoma there, there's another one there, and that's outside the radiation field. So the radiation might be associated with the lymphedema, as might be the surgery, of course, but it, in fact it is independent of a true radiation-induced uh, sarcoma. When you look up close, you can see that this woman has a number of lesions on the chest wall in the field, but you also have these other lesions outside of the field. And essentially that's, that's a lethal disease. This is a young boy who came to see us who has filarial uh, uh, lymphedema, obstruction of uh, the lymphatics from uh, parasites and brings with him this uh, picture, obviously, from another country with these just beginning to develop lymphangiosarcoma throughout this extremity. And uh, by the time he gets here, he has this huge fungating lesion that actually required a, a, a hemipalvectomy, something we don't usually do these days for, for sarcoma, just because he had this multifocal site. So it's very clear that lymphedema is an antecedent. And again, I remind you, there is no operation on the axilla or the groin that isn't accompanied by some degree of lymphedema. You look even in sentinel lymph node biopsy, if you look hard, hard enough and measure the diameter of a woman's right upper arm, there will be measurable lymphedema. Not the lymphedema we trust that will go on to this, but again, a, a problem that we create and we create surgically. Now, anyone who does axillary dissection for melanoma or groin dissection, we all carry some of these patients who have significant lymphedema not radiation induced, not, but surgically induced. And long term, not only is that itself a terrible disability, but it is also a precursor to those lesions I showed you. It's hard to talk about trauma because, apologize to the double X's in the room, some of you might consider uh, having a child, uh, a traumatic event and some, a joyous event and hopefully both. But of course, uh, we do see the abdominal wall desmoid, not a true sarcoma in the sense of any risk of malignancy, but associated with trauma. We do, it, do see it in the athlete at the insertion site of the deltoid and, you know, or the uh, other uh, uh, muscle groups. Um, chemicals are clearly associated. Uh, I guess Dr. Pruitt's here. The, the uh, dioxones, the ac active agent in Agent Orange was a phenoxy herbicide, and the veterans actually claimed that the, they had an increased prevalence of sarcoma based on their exposure to that. That's a rather tenuous argument. It does see there is a small association. It's mainly based on the work done in forestry workers who use a lot of phenoxy herbicides, but there are certainly chemically inducible uh, sarcomas. Those of you who've worked in laboratories are well aware that many of the tumor models you work with in rats and mice are usually chemically induced sarcomas, uh, like the methylcholanthrin induced sarcoma. So we should be again conscious that while rare, these events also still occur. We've learned a lot over the last uh, 30 years about it, and I'm going to do two or three uh, examples of that, again, trying to use sarcoma as an example of the way in which diagnosis is being clearly developed. Uh, we started, as I said, 7,000 cases. The commonest entity is liposarcoma, liomyosarcoma, and this entity, MFH, which is probably a, uh, no longer a, a valid term. There are true sort of MFHs, pleomorphic, a mixofibrosarcoma, but a lot of these probably belong in this fibrosarcomatous group. Uh, 
But that's uh, also interesting is that uh, we use the term synovial sarcoma. We now know for sure the one thing it's not associated with is synovium. That's a misnomer. But we really don't know the etiology of that. And that is in the process of being worked out. We know that by knowing the age of the patient, you can predict what's the likelihood of the of them having a sarcoma. So when you present me a sarcoma, if you do later today, just by knowing the age of the patient, I'll already have a better idea about what should happen. And of course, the com common ones in the uh, adolescent to early uh, adult life is synovial sarcoma and the desmoids. With rhabdo, the common one in children under 16 becoming less important. And as the age goes on, you can see how this changes. 31 to 50 liposarcoma dominates, and you start to see this uh, MFA entity, and as you get to an old, old effect, that uh, entity increases as does liposarcoma. So purely looking at these databases, nothing here except information to begin about what is the likely diagnosis. That just is uh, the other thing is the moment that you know about the histopathology, then you can be, think about, uh, as I said, it by sight alone. If it's a lower extremity lesion, then we would expect it to be li liposarcoma or FMFH. By the time you get into the viscera, essentially these are all lyomyo or actually what we now call GI stromal tumors. And so just knowing the site of the lesion, the age of the patient, you can already begin to predict what the probability is of that patient having a particular histopathology. And as Dr. Al said, more and more we go towards directed therapy, direct basic histopathologies. You don't need a pathologist to recognize that within these categories there are very patients. This is a liposarcoma. This is a more uh, mixed liposarcoma. This is a fibroblastic type. And this is a pleomorphic type. You don't have to be a, a, a pathologist to recognize one would expect the behavior of these to be very different. This is a very angry looking lesion under the microscope. You'd expect it to do badly. And we've tracked all of those based on histopathological subtype over the years. And this is a, a, just a recent publication which looks solely at liposarcoma. We'll come to it, but we're interested in nomograms and predicting. And you can see the very great difference between survival, 40% here, 90 plus percent here. Now that's important for another aspect because I'm interested in tr clinical trials, interested in interventions that might change this. And very clearly, if you didn't stratify for these entities within liposarcoma, then you'll certainly be unable to evaluate the pathology. Just imagine that you say, okay, I have a new agent that I'm going to give you, a magic tablet. I'm going to give it to all these people. I'm not going to give it to these people, but they all have liposarcoma. Of course, it would be a positive trial within, within months to years, and you'd stop the trial. So again, making the point that understanding the underlying biology, liposarcoma is not liposarcoma, allows you to transition to events such as clinical trials, which are, are highly dependent on the distribution. It's very difficult in what we call orphan diseases, like sarcoma, or, that are rare and uncommon. It makes it hard to do good trials. It makes it hard to understand uh, outcomes in a meaningful way. Historically, we've uh, talked about prognosis purely based on this grading observation. And this is a remarkable observation, that you can look down a microscope and say, here's a low-grade lesion, or here's a high-grade lesion, and the risk of metastasis is extremely low, and the risk may be as high as 50% just by that single observation. So no way do I want to denigrate the progress made in, in pathology. I'm going to tell you how we changed it. But in fact, this was good. And the other thing, other principle, of course, is this is a sort of a surgical slide, isn't it? It's a decision. You are low-grade or you're high-grade. And of course, in biology, none of that occurs. It's all a contiguum between some variation of low-grade and high-grade. Many people put in here an intermediate grade. I find that most frustrating because that says if I don't really understand, I'll just put it in the intermediate grade and we'll see how it plays out. That's no help, not helpful to people like myself who, who as you know, surgeons make uh, many decisions based on inadequate information. I mean, that's what we're good at. You don't have a choice in the operating room uh, confronted with a particular problem to decide why don't I wait and see what happens uh, uh, to the patient. You need to make a decision. And so that's good. And in fact, about two-thirds will be high-grade and one-third low-grade. And it's remarkable. Here's what I just said. This is disease-specific survival. This is only looking at extremity lesions. 
uh, primary extremity lesions. And here, your risk of dying of the disease is less than 10%. And here, in primary extremity, your risk of dying of the disease is about 40%. And while the early onset recurrences in high grade occur all within the first five years, you can see there's a continual increase, again, emphasizing the power of these databases, particularly when you're starting with people as young as 16 years old. So again, emphasizing uh, the behavior. It's interesting, why do these people die of disease? And we'll come back to that in a moment. We've done a number of other studies trying to predict this, and this is another good example of uh, if you have an interesting observation that seems exciting, then places like the New England Journal will take it. This is actually papered by Bill Kance, one of our fellows. And we were very interested in the retinoblastoma gene. And the gene product, the RB uh, product, is thought of as a tumor suppressor. So if your tumor suppressor had gone away, then, in fact, your, uh, if you had your tumor suppressor present, then, in fact, your survival would be very good at a short period of time. If the gene product was diminished, then your survival would be very poor. Isn't that terrific? That, that, isn't that wonderful? The New England Journal took it. It was only 13 cases. But, of course, what we'd done was we'd made the observation, so we quickly looked at all the pathology we had. And then we sat down, and I said, well, what, now's the time. Why don't we do this study correctly? Why don't we take the next 100 patients we see who have extremity lesions only because we know sight is important, that have high-grade lesions because that's the ones that's supposed to die, and we'll look at this analysis because it's just too good to be true. And, of course, what we found was that there was absolutely no different if you corrected for what was known clinically. And, again, of course, you can see how hard it was to get this published. It was a negative study, and no one wanted to publish it. The New England Journal certainly didn't want to hear about it. Uh, now, we've changed a lot. This is James Ewing. You've all heard of Ewing sarcoma. He was the pathologist at Memorial. He didn't exactly think too much about surgeons. He actually thought that radiation was the future of uh, uh, early cancer care. But he described a set of tumors by looking down a microscope, and they were small blue round cell tumors called the Ewing sarcoma. Now, out of that, we no longer do that. Out of that, we now make the diagnosis purely based on the genetic expression of those tumors. And you can see this Ewing's like gene combined with a number of other genes that literally defines where these tumors in a way we've never been able to do here. We no longer would make the diagnosis of myxoid liposarcoma without this TLS, FUS, CHOP fusion gene. Very important to, uh, in, in these diseases. And of course, this kind of diagnosis, this genetic molecular diagnosis, changes a number of things, not the least of which it says we wouldn't make the diagnosis of synovial cell sarcoma unless there was this SX1, uh, SX2 uh, fusion gene, and that the majority of those would express it. That becomes important because two reasons. One, it defines the entity, but it also has the potential to define the target. And so it does a number of things. For instance, in Ewing sarcoma, we always thought of that as a a childhood sarcoma. We thought of synovial sarcoma in some way related to synovium. And you can see we've seen synovial sarcoma in essentially all parts of the body purely because of our ability to make this true genetic diagnosis. Ewing sarcoma, as I said, the common age group was uh, the 10 to 30 year age group. And we've seen, oh, this is an older slide, we've seen patients in their 70s and 80s who actually have this Ewing sarcoma as defined by the genetic expression of particular genes. And that's the future. This desmoplastic small round cell tumor, very difficult often to diagnose, uh, uh, always thought to be a tumor of childhood, and we see it progressively in the older age group. So introducing again the concept for you now that with genetic or molecular diagnosis, then you begin to see things that you didn't see uh, previously with a precision that you didn't do. Obviously, with databases like this, we've had an enormous opportunity to actually define outcome. And uh, one of those uh, events is based on site. Now, this is a little busy slide, but you can see it's got large numbers of patients, so it should be valid. And what it says is that here's retroperitoneal uh, tumors. The majority of these will be retroperitoneal liposarcoma. And you can see that the death rate out in about 10 years is about 60%. And then if we just take the uh, visceral tumors, here's the visceral tumors, the GI stromal tumors, you can see the local disease-free survival. In other words, these have a high local recurrence rate, these have a low local recurrence rate, and you can <clears throat> see the extremity sits in about the same. So that describes what happens to local recurrence. <clears throat> if we look at the uh, 
death from disease, <coughs> excuse me, then you can see how this has changed. Now, this is death from sarcoma. Here we have the liposarcoma line looks pretty much the same as it did for the local recurrence. And here we have the visceral line, which looks very much like this line, like the retroperitoneal line, but its local recurrence rate was up here. So databases tell you about biology as well as about uh, numbers. What that says is these patients, the retroperitoneal liposarcoma, they're dying of their local recurrence. These visceral tumors are not dying of their local recurrence. That's up here. They are dying of systemic disease. Local recurrence is a surgical or perhaps a radiation therapy problem. Metastatic disease is a systemic problem. So purely by the observation and writing down and looking at it, we've defined the biology. We've influenced what, how we should treat it in a completely different way. These two look, if we just took this curve, you wouldn't be able to know anything. But knowing that the local recurrence rate uh, is here and here, we can say very comfortably that these people are dying of local recurrence or associated with local recurrence, and these must be dying of systemic disease. And to include those two as the same entity obviously would be foolish. So there's a lot of power to, <clears throat> to recording your observations that teaches you much more than about outcome. This is an overall uh, uh, slide just trying to describe what we did when we looked at a thousand patients who now just had uh, extremity soft tissue sarcoma, looking at what were the factors to pull all that together. It distributes the site as before. I told you the thigh was the commonest site and the lower, uh, the lower leg was greater than the upper. And we were able to put together on this busy slide entities that predict local recurrence and entities that cause death from sarcoma. And obviously local recurrence is more common if you've already had one. It's more common if you have positive margins and it's more common if you're over 50. But deaths from disease is due to high grade. Remember I told you high grade had a greater risk of systemic disease. Not surprising. That's what kills you. Large tumors, deep location. Interesting. Why should positive margins at the first operation predict death from disease? Because if that was truly a biological event, I can fix that. One way to guarantee no positive margin is an amputation. And if that was true, if this was a surgical problem, it was me that was the fault, I didn't, didn't do the operation right, then if I took off your leg, then that should disappear, shouldn't it? Uh, and we'll come back to whether or not that's so. Lymph node metastases, just to dismiss them, lymph node metastases uh, are very uncommon. If you see a lymph node metastasis in a liposarcoma, you have a right to say to the pathologist, would you like to re-examine the diagnosis? It's so uncommon. And of course, what that means is lymph node dissection is unlikely to help. So you quickly, by making this observation, dismissed the value of a prophylactic lymph node dissection in uh, the majority of soft tissue sarcoma. A little more common but rare numbers if you have the true epithelioid tumor, a nasty tumor, usually occurs around the perineum, uh, and the, uh, then you can occasionally see it. And if you have a lymph node metastasis, you can rescue a few people just as you rescue a few people by pulmonary resection, but in the main it is systemic disease. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, show you, talk to you briefly about nomograms, and if I had my laptop, I can bring it up live, but we won't be able to do that. But let me just tell you about nomograms. Nomograms, for those who don't understand it, is taking, a, again, a data set. It has to be a large data set. It has to have a large number of events. and has to be followed for a long time. And then taking factors that wouldn't normally appear in a staging system, evaluate their value in approving what's considered the predicted outcome for the individual patient. It's a powerful tool. The young people who haven't come to grips with this, this will be the future in some form. This is just an embryonic form in some ways. You will have on your, in my case on my palm pilot, nomograms for almost any entity. We have a nomogram, for instance, if a woman has a positive sentinel lymph node, place the numbers into the nomogram based on the primary tumor, size, site, all those, and predict what is the likelihood that if she had another if she had an auxiliary disease, there'd be another positive lymph node. It's a great tool for doing that. In pancreas cancer, we have one to look at to see what happens to a lot of variables. Historically, for instance, we wouldn't think that uh, splenectomy was a negative event in pancreas cancer, but it actually contributes to the nomogram. And what it really does is uh, it weights a number of events you don't need that wouldn't all be considered 
and weights them as a continuous variable or, or a discontinuous variable. Here's age, and you can see it varies. It, these are not uniform. You can see the pathology is weighted. Good news, bad news, very bad news. But they're not uniformly weighted. And basically, you add up the points. It's easy to do, easier to do on your computer. And you predict survival. Now, because we've got this large database, we can do it at 12 years for sarcoma. I could probably now do it for 20 if I, if I updated this. And what it really does is it says, <clears throat> using all of these factors, can we actually uh, uh, predict what the survival will be versus what the observed survival is? And the better the nomogram, the tighter these area bars, the, the straighter the line. Now think about that biologically. So now I've got a new biological marker, and I want to know, is it a value? And in a random observation, it's not a value. But if it entered into this nomogram and tightened those error bars, made them smaller, or straightened this line, then in fact, you've got an observation that's valuable. And, and you're going to hear a lot more about the, these in various forms, various uh, reiterations of that. And the way it works on your palm, you put down... Well, it's a high-grade lesion, it's deep, it's greater than 10 centimeters. it's called MFH, it's in the lower extremity, your age, 35, compute 12 years, sarcoma-specific death, probably 48%. That's much more positive than, than trying to say, what is the stage or the grade? Uh, and I think I did the, the uh, same thing. Here's low-grade tumor, deep tumor, large, retroperitoneal liposarcoma, older person, like specific probability, 37%. Now, for the patient, very powerful tool. <clears throat> now, before you run away and say, isn't that wonderful, Dr. Brennan can tell you exactly what's going to happen to me, no matter what's wrong with me, that's not so. The problem is you need, of course, large numbers. And we can do this, <clears throat> this kind of nomogram for about six different sarcoma types. We can actually do it for the subtypes of liposarcoma because we've got large numbers. But we can't do it for every, um, uh, as yet described last count, 56 different sarcoma types because there's not enough events. <clears throat> so I want you to walk away from here with the thought that nomograms are predictive tools for the individual. They are highly dependent on high-quality databases with large data sets and lots of events. And you'll hear more of them. Clinical diagnosis, uh, let's talk a little more about the problems. This is what we don't want to see. This is a left-hand dominant architect. His shoulder's up here. This is his elbow. This is his wrist. And both his doctors, his pathologists, and himself have failed each other. He's had an incision here, an incision here, an incision here, and now he's got tumor from there to there. That's a hard problem to fix. Your plastic surgeons aren't pleased about how can we possibly run a free flap across to cover all of his lower dominant arm and yet it's a low-grade tumor. It's not going to be the cause of his death. It's going to be cause of the demise of his arm. And all we really needed was if the first operation originally had been in a longitudinal fashion, or even now a true-cut biopsy, and all the uh, primary excisions had been in, in this line, and the pathologist had not found them, and the patient hadn't changed his surgeon three times, we wouldn't have that problem. Uh, and, of course, same thing. Here's the mid-thigh, big transverse incision. So as you biopsy, the surgical fellows, the residents in the room, as you biopsy anything, think about what's the next procedure. That's the thing most likely to help you place the incision, or more importantly, the true cut needle in the right place. A great big transverse incision here because you thought that it was a lipoma, and suddenly you've given me a huge problem. I've got to sacrifice all the skin. These tumors don't grow into the skin. If I have to put a skin graft on, I can't irradiate them. If I want to do uh, brachytherapy, then I have to put a flap there. So just consciously think about it. It's true about everything you do. If you are going to have to do the next procedure, think about where you'd like the incision. As opposed to this, just a huge tumor, true cut biopsy, diagnosis made, no skin required, down to the femur, procedure done. Huge difference uh, if we can just think. This uh, young man uh, was at the National Cancer Institute when I was there. And in 1975, uh, the treatment for this young boy would have been, this is a high-grade synovial cell sarcoma, the treatment of that was a four-quarter amputation. Those of you who have done these operations, they're mutilating operations, and if you Think about it, and you want to know what you did to this boy. Look, look at it, not at his, his absent arm, but look at his eyes. 
if you want to know what you've done to it. And of course, what we did at that time, initiated by Steve Rosenberg, a trial, a trial now that would be laughed at in its context. And it was a trial of amputation versus limb sparing surgery and radiation. And you could say, how can it be a randomized trial? There's 17 here and 27 here. Well, of course, we did it, um, a two-to-one randomization. Again, a statistically thing that just makes it harder for anything to be make a difference. Looking at that, and of course, how could you possibly walk in and get in front of someone by saying, yes, I appreciate that you're the high school quarterback, and we have this study which is involves we're either going to do uh, do a little incision on your knee and give you a little radiation, or we're going to cut off your leg above through the mid-thigh. And I well remember getting those kind of consents, and the, and the father would look at me and say, you're several expletives crazy. I'm taking my son away. And I would rightfully say, in 1975, you can take him wherever you want, but wherever you go, you will have, a, have an above knee amputation for that disease, because that is the standard treatment. And so we did this trial, and you can see the local recurrence. But what was more important, there was no difference in survival. And I've deliberately carried these data out and, and had, had them updated uh, with Steve out now 20 years, and you can see there was no difference. And so although the numbers were small, you can't throw that away. And that changed completely how we uh, practiced, and overall survival was the same. And so now, even a lesion of this size, which admittedly is not a synovial sarc sarcoma, but it's a pretty large lesion in the, in the axilla all down the chest wall, there is no reason for that person to lose their extremity, and the same for these kind of things here. The other thing we did was a trial to look at the value of radiation therapy. Now, this is a randomized trial, uh, and of course, there's a significant number now, 164 patients randomized intraoperatively. This was the, one of the first trials, was the first trial I ever did at Memorial, which was very difficult. I went there in 92, and there never been a randomized trial in the Department of Surgery, because they thought they knew everything. Um, I can now say that because the people who said that, Dr. Alst, are now uh, elsewhere. I wasn't able to say that for a long time, but they co constantly told me you didn't need to do trials. We know what it is. This is Memorial Sloan Kettering. You just have to come here. And I said, well, I didn't know. I thought you had to ask questions. No, no, after you've been here a while, you'll understand the answers. Uh, but anyway, we did this trial, and, and this now was a trial which intraoperatively we randomized patients to either receive or not receive radiation therapy. It happened to be by the brachytherapy technique. That's not a particularly important. But of course, we'd already learnt about what the variables were that predicted outcomes. So even although 164 patients have used stratified for the known variables, then you had a very powerful uh, opportunity that you'd be able to answer the question that you're asking. And it's, it's this kind of thing, large lesion, uh, excised sciatic nerve at the back, femur at the front, place the eye catheters, and over a period of four or five days, you can get um, uh, a full dose of uh, radiation therapy. And this was the results, and you see I keep updating them so that they're long-term. And in fact, we made a huge difference in local control by this radiation therapy, about a 20% uh, difference. Clear, and it's been maintained long-term. Long -term. So here, at last, we had an entity that says you begin at the here, your options are either to receive or not receive this entity, and we clearly can impact on long-term local disease-free survival. And even more dramatically, we impact it to an even greater risk, greater risk, even greater degree on the patients who have high-grade lesions. Remember, I told you these are the people likely to get systemic disease and die. So now I've asked a different kind of question than when I set out. I've asked a question, if I limit local control, by any intervention, in people who have a high risk of systemic disease, will I change that systemic disease rate? That's what surgeons would like. And of course, as you would have predicted, of course, there was absolutely no difference in the metastatic rate for those tumors. Making the comment that local control, don't get me wrong, very important for the patient, very important for the surgeon, very important to keep the limb, but in terms of its ability to prevent systemic disease, in high-grade lesions, it's not there. Another important observation purely made by writing down the information and looking at it in perhaps a little different way. Um, the other thing is that we learned a lot, and this maybe is too busy, but basically I, it always bothers me that we use the term local recurrence. Don't get too focused on it. You can look at this curve here is obviously worse than the... Uh, than, uh, 
this is death from disease. This curve is clearly worse than this curve. And all it really does is document that the nature of the local recurrence predicts the nature of the outcome. No surprise again if you think about it. Why wouldn't a large recurrence which occurs quickly be a worse actor than a late recurrence that is small? And obviously that, that's absolutely true. But when you take the step back, you say, okay, well, local recurrence is bad, Dr. Brennan. You just showed me that. But if you take it back, even if I'd prevented it here, I wouldn't necessarily have prevented this systemic death. Again, uh, emphasizing the point. What about adjuvant chemotherapy? Um, the, this, too, provides a, an example. Remember, I told you how difficult it was to do randomized trials in rare diseases. And so what happens in things like sarcoma, you put together a meta-analysis. You take all of the, the trials that have been done and try to pool them. And we pool, and those were pooled uh, by Vivian Branwell, and it said that without chemotherapy, you had a 60% uh, survival, and with chemotherapy, is a 10% survival. Highly significant. Looks like it makes a difference, right? It's not the randomized trial. It's a meta-analysis. It's, it's at least encouraging. And then all you have to decide, is this worth it? But the fact of the matter is if you look at overall survival, because we do rescue some of these people by pulmonary resection or hepatic resection, then the difference disappears. But it is in favor of adjuvant chemotherapy, isn't it? Now, this illustrates a very important point that's applicable to everything we do. Because think about what that means. 50% of the people who didn't get it didn't need it because they were never going to recur. 50% of the people uh, recurred anyway. So in fact, what you've done, 50% had no benefit. They were going to survive anyway. 46% had no benefit because they were going to die anyway. So you had to treat 100 people to get four survivors. Now you think about that's one in 25. Well, if you're that one, that might be okay. But now I want you to take it to the next level. You have a early stage breast cancer in a woman, less than one centimeter, no vascular, lymphovascular invasion predicted survival 92% without any further treatment. And it's absolutely no question that you can improve that because we've got large drug-based trials, thousands of patients, that says I can get from 92 to 93. Okay, but now let's apply that logic to here. Now we have to treat a hundred women to get one to benefit. And of course, that's fine, that's good, we treat. That would be fine if the treatment was benign. But remember, 100% of the patients get whatever side effects there are. They may not be great. They may be minor. If it was just taking a vitamin C tablet, we'd all do it. But we as surgeons particularly, and I think medical oncologists, we yet do the same. We emphasize, I can benefit. I can help your survival. We do not emphasize, and if you don't benefit, you get the same side effects as everyone else. I'm willing to take the, survival, the, the side effects if I'm the one patient. Am I really willing to take it when the high probability is I'm one of the 24 patients? Again, a principle that I think we fail to come to grips with in, in, in a way that, that is mean. It is not truth in advertising to say, I can improve your survival. Because that presupposes that, that when I don't, there is no downside. And of course, there's a downside to everything we do, whether it's a surgical operation or chemotherapy or anything else. And I'm really bothered that we don't do that. We now have another, the latest EORTC uh, e -E trial for this, the two effective drugs, adriamycin and iphosphamide, no difference in overall survival. Now in, a, in pretty much enough patients uh, to answer that question. So in sarcoma, we've not shown a benefit to adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, we do do pulmonary resection. It's not too important. There are a number of uh, people that you can help. It must be a complete resection that if you just take out uh, a pulmonary metastasis, it won't really benefit the patient. It's, it's as if you did no survival. But there are patients that can be salvaged uh, with uh, pulmonary metastectomy uh, in, if appropriate, selected. Not randomized trial. This is uh, good, good patient selection for people that can benefit by being treated. We do the same in liver metastasis. They're usually big symptomatic lesions where uh, you can r remove a solitary lesion and six months, this is courageous uh, uh, data. We need the slide down here that says three years. Um, but uh, there, are, there are occasions when we can salvage that. There are occasions when people are bleeding that you can help. But if you look at the fact that the high probability is that they'll still out here be recurring and often recurring in the, in the liver. 
Uh, no one can talk about sarcoma without talking about the treatment of GI stromal tumors because, of course, every, everyone hears about the use of Gleevec, the magic drug that makes everything better. And it is a really magic drug in, in some ways. Um, this is a typical gist, uh, just a tumor in the duodenum readily, readily resected, but what to do about it. And the problem is, of course, is that if you recur or have a metastasis from these tumors, it tends to be a lethal disease. And for many years, these are the 500 cases that we've looked after uh, prior to uh, the use of Gleevec, uh, it's really a, a lethal disease. So unless you make the diagnosis early, and even if you do, about 40% will recur and die of this disease. And along comes this drug, STI-571. I only show this slide because I think it's kind of pretty. But um, it is uh, uh, an interesting uh, drug because, of course, it binds to a specific receptor, a, a specifically expressed surface antigen. First, uh, first uh, described, of course, in, in uh, leukemia binding to the C. able gene. But, of course, we now uh, know that it is, uh, uh, binds particularly to the mutant-type C. kit which is expressed in all GI stromal tumors. And that's a, a, a remarkable event because here was a lethal disease. And here's the, the difference uh, just in non-random form of our treatment with, of patients who uh, have uh, GI stromal tumors either with this drug or without this drug. It's a cytostatic drug, of course. It, it, it doesn't st kill the tumor in the main. It just arrests its growth. It has the uh, attractive uh, advantage that there's an intermediary marker that we can actually... Uh, 1901, we can actually do a PET scan, and if this person responds within two weeks uh, on the PET scan, then we know it'll be effective in that agent. If they don't respond in a PET scan, then in fact it's no, probably no value in continuing the drug. It's, uh, the, here's an example, a rapid progression, no real change, and it's confirmed by PET scan and confirmed by CT. They're not likely to help. The other interesting thing, of course, is that we can actually now begin to dissect the mutations within the CKIT gene and actually look at the response of a particular mutation so that we can take your tumor, not only show that you've got a mutated CKIT, but actually look at the exon, the specific mutation. Fortunately, the common mutation is in exon 11, and that's the most responsive one. That's good news. But if you have a CKIT mutation and it's in the PGF, PDGF um, family of... Uh, uh, mutations, then you're unlikely to respond. You'd start on that, but you'd be quick to change. And if you can't identify the mutation, it's somewhere that you can't find which uh, particular part of the gene is mutated, then you're unlikely to respond. Another example of the direction in which we're going in this early comment about molecular diagnosis. Now we're going to molecular diagnosis, identification of the target, ta attacking the target, defining the fine print of the target, and telling you whether or not you'll respond. A very exciting thing to do, I think. Um, that says the same kind of thing. That says the same thing. Now, we've done a number of randomized trials, and this is to, just to emphasize that surgeons can do these trials. This is a trial put up by uh, when I was chief of the sarcoma committee of the ACASOG and led by Ron DiMatteo, the person who's done all the work, who's in my department as a surgeon. And the first trial, because everyone thought it was great, was just to take the high-risk lesions and uh, uh, treat them with uh, Gleevec for 12 months. Of course, that's not the key trial. The real trial is, can we do a randomized trial? And it was only because it was 2001 and we were able at that moment to sort of uh, uh, strike immediately that we were able to do this trial, complete gross resection of what we might call high-risk tumors. We now know that it's related to mitotic rate. And they actually received placebo or imatinib for one year. It was allowed to be crossover if the recurse or the patient wasn't deprived if the drug worked. And many of you will know that the analysis of these tumors, uh, about 40% of them were small lesions, about 25% were very large lesions. They were equally distributed between the two, and the results were truly dramatic. This is just recurrence-free survival. The patients, of course, have not died. And you can see this uh, 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 group that did not receive the drug recurred just as they had previously. People who received the drug did not recur. Here's the one year. Remember, they stopped the drug here, and then they begin to recur. So a highly effective adjuvant, a trial that could probably never be done again, such that the trial was stopped 100% at, at one year, not, not surprisingly, because that's when the drug stopped. When you stop the drug, they begin to recur, and it didn't really matter whether you were an intermediate-sized tumor or a large tumor particularly. The effect was seen here, 80% to 67%. So just emphasizing that. That's a rapid tour through what I've learned from studying one disease 
and studying it, I think, thoughtfully. I wish I'd done a lot more, obviously. But if you begin to look at these uh, kind of databases and you begin to put down what you, uh, uh, what you know about, then you will learn something. And there's nothing unique about that. Lord Kelvin, the person who invented the Celsius scale, said that 150 years ago. It's a privilege to be here. I appreciate the invitation, particularly from my senior friend here. And thank you very much. thing in San Antonio on it, including the Alamo. We'd like to uh, thank you very much. An appreciation of your uh, thank you visit. Right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Inhalation radiation due to sarcoma swallowing breast surgery. Are, is there, although this is a poor prognostic prognosis entity, as you stated, are there any unique molecular or genetic signatures that identify individuals within this group who may actually indeed do better or could benefit from different types of adjuvant therapy? Yeah, it's a terrific question. It's, it's, it's a good question, an obvious question. We've got a, a study going at the present time trying to look at uh, the gene signature of patients who have angiosarcoma, who both receive radiation and not. Preliminary results don't suggest that at least this far, we can find what that gene signature is. It's going to be there, I think, because we know if we take the retinoblastoma kids you, and they get irradiated, they clearly a propensity to develop uh, sarcomas in other sites, get irradiated for their uh, retinoblastoma and have a lesion in the retroperitoneum or wilms or something. Well, that happens without radiation. It happens with radiation. So we should be able to sort that out. But the, the short answer is we don't have a gene signature, but it's I think it'll be there. The problem is my gene signature may not be your gene signature. That will, that's a different issue. Um, I'm wondering more on um, the Well, I think you're asking the question which is being debated in the New England Journal at the present time, and that's what is the risk of uh, continuous high-dose CT scanning. Because remember, as we go, we always thought that CT scan, well, it was a uh, flight from New York to San Antonio on a sunny day. We now know that as we go to, to rapid sequencing CT, you would have thought, well, gee, that must decrease the amount of radiation. But of course, we go to rapid sequencing, three millimeter cuts, we actually increase the radiation dose. And if you want to read that, there's a whole debate going on in the New England Journal in the last 18 months about how real that is and what it means. I think it has changed our behavior, our sensitivity to seeing people who certainly with sarcoma can be followed just as well with MRI as they can with CT, that we see more and more usage of MRI. There is no free lunch in medicine, whether you're a surgeon or anything else. There's a price for everything. It just depends how much you want to pay. Yeah, along those lines, actually, um, in the trauma world, and I've talked to a couple of surgical oncologists, we're, we're seeing more and more patients where we saved their limb that ruined their life. And uh, I'm wondering if there's good you know, quality of life follow-up on some of these limb salvage patients. Yeah, the only, the only data that I know of was an original study done, uh, it was actually done out of, out of the NIH, where they looked at limb function following these people who got fit, amputation or uh, limb sparing. And essentially, there was no difference. You, you won a little bit, some on the, what you lost on the swings, you won on the roundabouts. In my own mind, with no data to address it, I think if I had a synovial cell sarcoma of the ankle that invaded bone, I'd have an amputation. Uh, and yet, everyone would tell me, gee, we can take that piece of bone out, we can replace it, we can put a free flap there. But at my age, I'll be way better off. We joked last night, I guess it's not apocryphal, I have a finger missing. And I had a reattachment, which was probably destroyed my life for eight or ten weeks. I should have just gone to the local hospital and had it off. And we forget that. But, of course, everyone wanted putting my finger back on their CV, but nobody wanted taking my finger off on the CV. Uh, one question about uh, this is kind of a very specific, relatively uncommon operation. 
um, where should it be happening? And um, what level of, uh, let's see, oversight should the... Uh, well, I think that, that, that's the challenge for the current generation. I don't think there's any question that the, uh, the data shows in every disease we've now studied, not only perioperative mortality, because we've written a lot about that for complicated procedures. But, you know, if you're driving down the freeway and you get hit by a truck, you're better off in a level one trauma center than you are in the surgical outpatients. I mean, it's not too difficult to work, work it out. The real challenge, though, is if we're going to put volume, because that's what we're using at the moment. We're using volume as a surrogate for, for outcome. And we know that even long-term outcome, now good data in the Medicare population, Medicare population for cancer, that long-term outcome is improved by treatment in high volume centers to start. The real problem is, what is that volume? And it will change from what disease you do. For coronary eye bypass grafting, it's probably 250 cases a year. For pancreatic cancer, it's probably 10 cases a year. And we as surgeons, I think, have been remarkably unwilling to address that issue because it's always seen as, I'm taking the operation away from the general surgeon who wants to do it. Well, actually, very few surgeons want to do something once a year. They don't like it. It doesn't work very well. So our challenge, which I don't think we've addressed well, although we've got some good data now, what is the level at which that comes into place? How many cases, until we have a better surrogate, do you need to do to make your results the same as mine. Because it's very unfair. The general surgeon in this country's results for pancreatectomy are based on my mortality rates. And if I do 150 in a year and have a mortality rate of 1.8%, he or she is judged when he does one. Well, no, he does two and one dies, it's 50%. So it's very unfair how we do it. But I think there is a solution. Long answer to a short question. So, uh, the program stuff is interesting. It's basically mm -hmm. looking at a risk of whatever. So, it's a, it's a, mm -hmm. so have you used that methodology in any of your clinical trials to look not at mortality but at risk? Terrific, risk? terrific question. What, what I believe you're asking me is if you draw a line and it says here's the predicted and here's the observed, we want that line to be terrific. And we do that with a big data set. And then we now don't add another gene, we add a treatment. Now, if the treatment works, then the observed mortality should be less than the predicted. The problem with that is no one will believe that unless you apply that to a randomized trial. And we've tried to do that with the randomized trial of radiation therapy. And I can't show that it's got enough significance. But, but it... What I need is a nomogram. In some ways, I wish I did do breast cancer. I need a thousand patients with a lot of, and then a specific intervention to validate it. But it, it, intuitively, it's right. If you do better than you predicted, it should be okay. But we need more numbers. Sarcoma is hard in that sense. Yeah. GI stromal tumors? Yeah, where yes. You go and do a major resection if it's gastric and it involves the left lobe of the liver and possibly the tails. Like yes. Yeah. Well, uh, the, the short answer is yes, because remember, even with imatinib, sujin, no one is cured. All that happens is you decrease the activity of the tumor. What I think we might do, what we think, what we do do in that situation, you've got a really potentially hot and morbid operation would treat them ahead of time, but still with the intent to resect them. The next challenge is how aggressive should we be with recurrent and persistent disease? Because we know they will develop a clone that is non-sensitive. And we progressively are going back to take people who've actually had metastatic disease, they've responded to imatinib, they've got a couple of cold spots and they've got a one lesion that still takes it up, and we are going back and taking those out. I don't know whether that's right, but it's what I would have done for me because it's a cytostatic treatment. So yes, I do believe we are much more aggressive and I think it's reasonable to be so. Sorry, that was a marvelous review. The uh, effect of radiation mm. on secondary sarcosis. 
Is that dose related? So there's some threshold dose below which that does occur? No, they're different kinds of tumors, but the, remember in therapeutic radiation, it's always, always between four and 6,000, so therapeutic. The only way you can address that is to look at the people who, like in childhood, got irradiated for their tonsils or the thymus. And we know that's associated with thyroid cancer, but it's a relatively unimportant cancer in that sense. So it's hard to define the dose in the large numbers because everyone gets a therapeutic dose at four to 6,000 rats, so I don't know. It is time dependent. The median time to a radiation juice sarcoma is 12 years. As early as two, two years and as long as 25 years. Thank you very much. Was that all right? Yes, beautiful. Good. Glad you liked it. I thought about it a lot.